Welcome to this presentation of Some Things You May Not Know About Cheshire by Barry Emery. This presentation was first given in 2018, but not recorded. So I am re-presenting it here and recording it using Zoom. As an introduction, let me just tell you that I've lived in Cheshire since 1974 and I'm a retired computer teacher. I began getting interested in Cheshire's history when I started hiking to find the corners of their boundary and wrote this first book. My research led me to several historical mysteries and I decided to put them into my second book. I then wrote a third about Cheshire's industrial past. After presenting a lecture on Cheshire's homes, I ended up writing Brooklyn Comes to Cheshire. And I republished the history of Cheshire written in 1885 by Rayner and Petterclerk. I added a initial chapter with information that they did not have and then I added an index with lots of photographs and maps because their original book did not have any maps or photographs. And I wrote a, another book called The Mammoth Cheese Event When America Watched Cheshire, arguably the most famous event in Cheshire's history. And my last book is What Is and What Was, a Historical Virtual Tour of Cheshire. The book is sort of a coffee table type book with lots of photographs on one side, what you would see today, such as that photograph of Church Street at the red light, and on the other opposing page, what was, with historical commentary about each photograph. Okay, so let's get started with today's presentation. Believe it or not, much of Cheshire was once in Lanesboro. Here's a map of Lanesboro, and that star represents the very center of the village, sort of right where the red light is today on Church Street and Route 8. And when Cheshire was incorporated, part of Lanesboro became Cheshire. Here's the boundary line of Cheshire and Lanesboro now. In one of my talks, explains why that boundary line is so jagged. So I'm not gonna go into the detail now, but if the, the talk about Cheshire's incorporation and the shape it's in discusses that subject. So one of the things that I discovered that I thought was rather interesting is that Cheshire once had a roller skating rink. And that roller skating rink, of course it's, goes back in time, so who knows what their roller skates look like. Maybe that, or maybe a little more modern. It was located on Dean Street. And that arrow points to about where it was. This map from 1904 shows the actual building. It was called Dean's Hall. And it had a roller skating rink. Another thing that you may not know about Cheshire is that we were, we were the trolley hub of the Berkshires. We were the only town in Berkshire County that had three trolley companies servicing our community. Berkshire Street Railway out of Pittsfield, Pittsfield Electric Street Railway, and Hoosick Street Railway out of Adams. This is a map of the trolley lines, and that arrow points to the Berkshire Street Railway, how it came up Route 8, crossed at the causeway, went along the west side of the reservoir and then into town. This arrow points to the Pittsfield Street Railway, which came from Lanesboro, right along Lanesboro Road, and then into town. And finally, from the north, the Hoosick Street Railway, which came into town on Richardson Street, and then School Street, and then up Church Street to the town hall. 
Here's a picture from a photograph of the Pittsfield electric trolley on Lanesboro Road in Farnham's. That overhead tram system was used to carry lime from the crushing plant down to the kilns. The causeway um, trestle, which brought the Berkshire Street Railway across the reservoir, was replaced later by this steel one. The railroad track is also shown there, and that was used to um, bring product from the Farnham Lime Company. This is a newer photograph of the causeway. The curved portion on the left was for automobiles. The earthen slope replaced the trolley trestle. And then the railway was along the right side. This is the map of the center of Cheshire and it sh shows the trolley lines with a dashed line. This is how the Pittsfield Street Railway came into town. It went up Route 8, curved down Church Street to the town hall. And this is how the, um, excuse me, the Pittsfield Electric came into town. The first one was the Berkshire Electric. And finally, the Hoosick Street Railway came from School Street. By the way, in this map at this time, Church Street was known as Main Street. And this photograph shows all three trolleys from the various lines meeting at the town hall. The annex building, which is the smaller building behind the town hall, was at that time the trolley office. It had a little refreshment area in there where you could buy sandwiches and coffee and you bought your tickets. Now it's amazing how many people rode the trolleys. This is a statistic from 1903 showing the number of passengers paying revenue carried during that year. And it's underneath that blue rectangle. Before I reveal it, take a guess. I'm sure you underestimated. 2,204,066 paying passengers on the Hoosick Valley Street Railway in 1903. Below that is just a sample ticket from the Berkshire Street Railway. Okay, let's take on something else that you may not know, that underneath the reservoir was something called Muddy Brook. And in the old, old maps of Cheshire, it's labeled as a pine swamp in the area and the brook named Muddy Brook. Today we have the beautiful reservoir because that brook got dammed. The name for this body of water is rather confusing. Some people call it the Hoosick Reservoir, some the Hoosick Lake, some Cheshire Reservoir, and some Cheshire Lake. I believe the correct name is a Cheshire Reservoir because it was dammed man-made for a specific purpose. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The whole name Hoosick is rather confusing. This is from the internet. The Eswiltecook Rail Trail passes through the Hoosick Valley between Mount Greylock and the Hoosick Mountains, the Cheshire Reservoir with the Hoosick River. Nobody seems to have decided what the right spelling is. 
here's an early map where they spelled it even differently. I'm glad they stopped using that one. And here's some more maps showing different spellings from different years. AC seems to have been pretty popular. But then the later maps switch to IC. Who knows why? I never found out a reason. I think it was the map maker's prerogative. Nice aerial view, actually taken from a passenger plane, a, a Southwest passenger plane, going from Bradley to Chicago. Now we owe our reservoir to the idea of some men from Adams. Believe it or not, they petitioned the state. Their names were Sanford, Blackington, William Plunkett, and Wheeler. And they wanted to dam that river, that muddy brook, so that they could have a more reliable water supply for their mills and atoms, especially during the summer. They petitioned the state in 1869. Now, in that petition, the Pittsfield and North Adams Railroad Corporation had to change the location of their railroad because once the reservoir was created, their railroad line would have been underwater. So they were authorized to move it to the east side of the reservoir. Here's a map showing the original railroad as it crossed Muddy Brook. That center line right inside this rectangle is the straight line of the railroad. I actually counted at one time that it crossed Muddy Brook seven different places. And this, some gentleman put some platforms just underneath the Thames River and appeared to be walking on water. Believe it or not, you can do the same thing in the Cheshire Reservoir. The reason is they remove the railroad tracks to the east side of the reservoir where this green arrow is pointing, but they did not take the railroad bed away. And so when the water level is low in the reservoir, down just a little bit, you can get out of the boat and actually stand on the old railroad bed. And the water will be about up to your knees and you can walk along. What I've done here is overlaid a newer map from 1876 over the older 1854 map so that you can see Muddy Brook as it wound its way through the area. Now, believe it or not, in 1855, Cheshire was an industrial um, power. We actually shipped more tonnage on the railroad than any other town in Western Massachusetts except Springfield. We shipped butter, cheese, potatoes, sand, iron, leather, and lots of lumber. Let me show you some pictures of that old railroad. Look at this old photograph. That's the coal bin that you see there. By the way, the building in the left edge of the photograph is the old Cheshire School the reason that School Street is so named. Yeah. We had a total of four tracks here, sidings where cars could be parked and loaded with the lumber or the sand or the other products that we were shipping out of town. The old trains needed water. So next to the railroad station was this large water tank. 
And this is the picture of the old Cheshire station. It was altered after a fire. And I'll show you a newer photograph. I think I like about this one is the uh, old sign on the station wall, the buggies lined up. And there's a man running with a cash register in his hand. I think he's probably, well, maybe he stole it and he's running to catch the train. And I'm pointing to the arch, the uh, support for the roof, because I'm going to show you that some prominent citizens secretly added graffiti to the train station, and it's still visible today. This is what the new supports to the roof look like little fancier than what the originals were. And there's the place where they added the graffiti. And when that was painted over the years, everyone left that portion where they had written their names in the original wood so that you can still see them today. Here's some close-ups of what it looks like. And believe it or not, these were the most prominent men in town. And I'm guessing that they were the ones that helped to renovate the station and decided to put their name on, the, on it. One of the names is Alonzo B. Brown. Another one is Warden R. Brown. He, I know, was a very accomplished carpenter and built one of the historic homes of Cheshire that I talk about in one of my other talks. John M. Brown, he was infamous for his stone carving, which I will talk about in one of my future talks. He loved putting his name on stone. And the last name, I'm not 100% sure. It's the hardest one to read. It looks like it's Eugene W. Brown. However, I was not able to locate him in the census. We did have a famous man in town at the time known as Eugene Bowen, but his middle initial was not W. His middle initial was B, and that's definitely not a B between Eugene and the last name. So I'm pretty sure it may be Brown. And then underneath their names, they wrote Cheshire Mayors. This is some of the carving of John M. Brown, one of those signatures from the train station, train station. And I have a whole story about him in my historical mysteries book. You can see some of his rock carving here. Okay, the Mammoth Cheese, a very famous event. We made the cheese in 1801 and we delivered it to Thomas Jefferson in 1802. Here's some things that you may not know. For one, we weren't the only one who made a Mammoth Cheese. This photograph is often mistaken as Cheshire's Mammoth Cheese. However, it is not. It is actually from Ontario, made in 1866, and actually much larger than Cheshire's cheese. Our mammoth cheese weighed 1,235 pounds. Now, Cheshire led the nation in the 1830s in, in a movement. And here is the movement. It was the temperance movement, the banning of alcohol. This old, this old uh, poster, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. And it was the women who tended to lead this banning of alcohol. Well, Cheshire had a lot of taverns right from the very beginning of our community. Burt's Tavern, and Stafford's Tavern and Remington's Tavern were up near Stafford Hill. Daniel Chapman's was also near Stafford Hill. 
And then down in the village, we had Madad King's Tavern and Walcott's Tavern and Hall's Tavern. The red numbers indicate where those taverns were located around Stafford Hill. Here's a look at photographs of some of them, the, the only ones that I could find photographs of. This is Daniel Chatton's on Windsor Road. Still uh, uh, there today in a private home. But that King's Tavern is no longer there. The home uh, has been raised. Here's Walcott's Tavern. That's down in the center of town, right by the red light. And that building is still there, but it doesn't look anything like this. It was transformed in the 1860s to a private home. Here's what it looked like. And that building is still there, but in terrible shape and will soon probably be torn down. And just up the street is Hall's Tavern, later to become the Cheshire Cat Tea Room. And that is still there, now a private home. So I found this in the 1858 Berkshire Eagle. Cheshire. Some of the temperance citizens of Cheshire, fearing that the action of the town in relation to enforcing the liquor law at the annual meeting might be informal called a special meeting on the same subject and again almost unanimously voted to instruct the selectmen to enforce the liquor law. Apparently Cheshire had a liquor law. Well from the 1885 history of Cheshire I found that James Brown gave ten dollars for use of poor instead of for liquor on his election. Voted in 1837 to approbate no person to sell spiritous liquors except tavern keepers and tavern keepers to sell only to travelers, not to the inhabitants of the town of Cheshire. By the way, James Brown didn't make his reelection bid. Here's some, believe it or not, curiosities about our cemeteries. First of all, Wells Cemetery, John Wells, it's not on Wells Road. And Jenks Cemetery is not on Jenks Road. Colonel Stafford's body was taken from his grave and is now in the crypt at Stafford Hill Monument. And finally, one cemetery has 126 gravestones without bodies underneath. We have eight cemeteries. I'm gonna name them here and tell you where they are uh, and show you some information about them. But one is on West Mountain Road. One is on North Street, Route 8. One is on Ingalls Road. One is on Jenks Road. One is on Wells Road. One is on Fales Road. And one is on Windsor Road. And finally, there is one on Savoy Road, which is 116. Now the one on West Mountain Road is our main and largest cemetery. And North Street, most people can see from Route 8. And Ingalls Road is also visible when you drive along Ingalls Road. But the last five are not that well known. So let's talk about some of them. First of all, here's a map, modern map of Savoy Road 116. And that red X up near the Gulf is a cemetery. And that cemetery seems a little out of place up in the woods there. But originally, the road 116 
when on Pleasant View Drive, and then where this red dashed line went up the hill towards Stuart White Road. So it actually went right next to where that cemetery is. That cemetery is known as Burt's Cemetery. I'll show you some gravestones from it in a minute. But while I'm talking about relocating roads, Henry Wood Road is another one in the upper left corner of this map. And it was relocated from that tree line that you can see there. It used to come out right where Sand Mill Road intersects 116. Now that's a private driveway. But that was the original Henry Wood Road location. Here's a gravestone from that Burt's Cemetery up near the Gulf. Elijah Burt. And here's some other cemetery, uh, stones, gravestones from that same cemetery. Then the Wells Brown Cemetery, which is on Windsor Road, it's actually on private land. And Colonel Stafford was originally buried in that cemetery. And here's some gravestones from it. The cemetery is on land now owned by the Martins, part of the Martin farm. And here's a photograph of Jenks Cemetery. It's from the Jenks family, located just off of Wells Road. It's actually behind a private home. Well, it's not easy to, to see from the road and you would need to get permission to go look at it. The Fales Road Cemetery is not real visible from the road, but you can park along Fales Road and walk out to the cemetery and it is still maintained by the town. And then the last image I'm gonna talk about, this is from the uh, History of Cheshire, written in 1885. An ancient burial place across from the Baptist church in a neglected field, half walled, overgrown, and evoking a feeling of unrest and neglect. Town of Cheshire voted to plan a new cemetery in 1859, and some graves were moved to the new one on West Mountain Road. The remaining stones were haphazard, and because of the object objections of a neighbor, all the stones were moved into the present rows in the late 1890s. And actually, they were widening and reconstructing Route 8 at the time. And they didn't move the bodies, which now lie unmarked much nearer to the highway. Here's what the cemetery looks like. All the stones neatly placed, about two or three feet apart. Not enough room for the actual crypts to be buried in that location. Nice and neat looking. The actual bodies are closer to the road. There is one stone that looks out of place. Let me tell you about that one. It's so close to the other stones that it was put there after the other markers were moved. That person has two gravestones. This one here, but her body is not here. But she now has a stone next to her husband's stone. It's the wife of John Buckland. She died June 23rd, 1776 of smallpox. And at the time, people who died of smallpox were not allowed to be buried in a regular cemetery. So she was buried more or less out in the woods up near property that they owned. I'll show you that in just a moment. 
But later on, family members decided that she ought to have a gravestone in a cemetery next to her husband. And that's when Jerusa Buckland got her gravestone next to her husband. Here's where she was buried when she actually died. They weren't, they were, she was buried on Mount Amos, which is pictured in this photograph. It's up off of Wells Road. And I went out looking for her tombstone and I did find it out in the woods. I put a piece of blue ribbon around it and a, a marker. Okay, the next thing that you may not know is something about a notorious madam who ran a brothel. Let me read this to you from the 1892 New York Times. Proprietor of a notorious house held Josephine Dumont of number 160 East 64th Street was held in a thousand dollars bail by Justice Ryan in the Yorkville Police Court yesterday, charged by Captain Strauss of the 67th station with keeping a disorderly house. It is said that three police captains have tried to close the place during the last 10 years, but could not get sufficient evidence. A few days ago, Captain Strauss sent Officer McConnell to the house when the officer got the necessary evidence. The woman waived examination and the case will go to court for general sessions. What does that have to do with Cheshire? Well, she lived in this house, the Greylock Villa in Cheshire on Richardson Street, one of the grandest house in, houses in town. She bought the house and lived there for 13 years or so. She's actually buried in Cheshire Cemetery. And she gave a lot of money to the town in her will. And one of the things that was done to, to with that money was to put a very elaborate gate at one of the cemetery roads. And it's inscribed Dumont Memorial. Or Josephine Dumont. And this is her family plot inside that beautiful white gate. Her stone, however, is not the big one. Her stone is this little small one. Josephine, wife of Dr. John J. Dumont, born at Cheshire Mass, December 30th, 1824. So she was born in Cheshire. She ended up going to New York City, running a very successful brothel, but came back to Cheshire and bought the Greylock Villa and used it as her summer residence. She died August 22nd, 1897. And her gravestone says, Gone where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Okay, another item of interest is our one of our stores in operation for 174 years. It's no longer in operation, but those of us in my time know it as H.D. Reynolds. Let's take a look at its history. It was built in about 1844 and known as Walcott's. George Z. Dean and son took it over and they ran the store for many, many years. Notice the telephone symbol on the front of the store. I believe it may have been the first place in town to actually get a phone. And then I noticed this sign in the window, Japalag. And I did some research to find out exactly what that was advertising. It turns out it's a high grade varnish and stain.
H.D. Reynolds took over the store in about 1937. An interior view of the store in 1940. Hadn't changed much when I moved to town in the 1970s. And of course, George Reynolds on the right and his son, excuse me, and his, his George Reynolds on the left and his father, Stan Reynolds on the right for many years running that store. And the, and the uh, lawn mow, mowing and snow blowing business out in the back. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of Believe It or Not. And I have several others that I hope you will enjoy as well. Thank you for listening.